My family moved to West Scarborough when I was ten. We first lived in a bungalow here on Glen Shepherd Drive just beside the Montreal train tracks. I started school in grade six at Walter Perry Public School on the other side of Danforth. Things must have been tough for my parents. My dad was a bricklayer and building subcontractor immigrating from England. Bricklaying was a pretty seasonal activity even in Toronto. We just spent a year in Saskatoon following the advice the Canadian government was giving to immigrants in the building trade. It had been lousy advice. As for my mother, she'd worked part-time in England, but here she found herself having to work a full 40-hour week on the harbour front at a time when the transport system wasn't nearly as good as it is today. It's only now that I realise how exhausting all this must have been and where some of the frayed tempers in our family came from. Anyway, I started grade 7 and we moved from the bungalow to what must have been a lower rent apartment above the smoke shop on Nob Hill Plaza on Eglinton. Today, Caps Variety, 40 years ago, Bob's Smoke Shop. Not a hell of an evolution. The plaza looks pretty much the same also. Some of the shop names haven't changed, others are a bit more exotic, but otherwise it's still the same ugly example of no frills Canadian commercial building. Having your friends over to a back terrace under the phone lines wasn't as much fun as having your own backyard. So when they could, my parents moved out again. We found a house to rent back on Glen Shepherd. My brother and I stayed at the same school. We each had our own bedroom. And by the time I started grade nine, they were talking about buying the place. They eventually did. And on the left is the bedroom window I looked out of all the way through high school up to the end of my BA. What I didn't realize then was that we were part of a whole demographic movement, even more, of a big upheaval of change in the society, in the city, in the education system. Rick Schofield of the Scarborough Archives told me about it. What can you tell me about the evolution of the demographics of the area, the catchment area that Midland drew its students from? Um, the area was initially established about 1920s um, as an extension of Scarborough Junction. It was called Kitchener Park, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of houses that were built on both sides of Midland Avenue uh, between 1925 and, and 1950. Very small houses on, um, on, on small lots. Not well-to-do people, but people who nonetheless wanted to live in single-family houses as opposed to living in, in downtown where apartments were starting to be you know, three, four-story walk-ups were, were being built. So there was a core group of people living in that area from about 1923 on. The name Kitchener Park conjures up memories. We often crossed it with my friend Doug coming back from school. He lived in one of those small wood frame houses Rick talks about on the other side of the park. His mother still lives there. Scarborough at that time primarily looked after the elementary schools. Um, there was an elementary school in that area called Kitchener Park. It was a small uh, one-room school that housed the children from that subdivision. Mm -hmm. And the high school children initially left Scarborough to get their education. Immediately after the, um, the war, there was a beginning of amalgamation of the rural uh, school boards. And in 1954, the Scarborough Board of Education was established. At that point in time, it was decided that more secondary schools were necessary. So they split the R.H. King community up, built David Mary Thompson Collegiate, and then in 1962, Midland. Mm -hmm. This is Eglinton Avenue. This is Midland Avenue. And you are looking east, about 1952. Okay, so we can see that north of Eglinton is still farm. Yeah, north of Eglinton, which is this area here, is all farmland. And this area down here is the Kitchener Park area. Okay, in this picture, this is Eglinton Avenue here. This is the railway tracks that is midway between Midland Avenue and Kennedy. And over here is Midland Avenue. This is the original Kitchener Park subdivision that was constructed in the 1930s and 40s prior to the Second World War. 
This is a more recent subdivision that was constructed uh, in the early 50s. This picture is taken in, I believe, about 1956 or 58. The, this area here, which is a large empty field at this time, is where Midland Avenue Collegiate is today. Midland Avenue Collegiate was the school I went to from 62 to 66, grades 10 to 13. We were grateful when it opened. Before that, we'd had to walk the mile and something to and from Thompson Collegiate on Lawrence every day. Midland was a new school with a great auditorium, wide corridors, bright cafeteria. Later, a swimming pool was added on. It had well-equipped commercial and tech wings going with the highly streamed and segregated education of the time. And it was big, very big. Even today, the massive brick walls look down like some fortified cathedral onto the racetrack and sports field. Bob Gidney and Wynne Miller, education historians, talk to me about the movement of the time from their point of view and as teachers. The context of the massive building program that took place in uh, the 50s and 60s, it happens for, it happens for several reasons. One is simply d demography. Uh, Ontario and, and, and most of Canada, I mean, most of the Western world had some kind of baby boom in the years after the war. Canada had one of the highest rates of birth anywhere in the Western world uh, from the very late 40s to the very early 60s. And Ontario, of course, uh, as the big industrial province, experienced just massive growth uh, in terms of its population uh, during those, uh, those two, two and a half crucial decades from roughly from about 1947 or 48 through to about 65. And so that under any circumstances, there would have had to be massive school building going on right across the province. And at the very same time, of course, you have the urbanization of Ontario, very rapid urbanization, and of course the rate of urbanization is highest in the greater Toronto area, which in the 50s and 60s meant the what are now called the inner suburbs, uh, Scarborough, North York, and uh, Etobicoke. So there's the demographic effect, it's called the baby boom itself. Secondly, there is the policy decision to, uh, to keep all our kids in school, high school, which put tremendous pressure on, on, for high school expansion. Then the third factor is individual parents and kids, and particularly working class parents and kids, making the decision that even though I don't have to stay in, sc I don't have to stay in school beyond 16, we want our kids to stay in school till they finish and go on and, get, and have opportunities, and the classic phrase that I was raised with, to have opportunities that we never had ourselves. So there's tremendous pressure uh, on the high schools, and not surprisingly, in, a, in an era where, we're, where we've got a booming economy, where we not only got pressures on the schools, but we can afford to build those schools, uh, schools get built. When you think of the stats, 1945-1946, Scarborough has one single high school, uh, Scarborough Collegiate Institute, which becomes R. H. King. But four oh, wow. high schools, four high schools in 1956, uh, seven in '61. Right now, it's 1969. It's got 17 high schools. Right, 1972. It's got 20. So what are we looking at? We're looking at uh, 13 new high schools in. Uh, in um, less than 50, 11 years? This staggering expansion. We both taught 64 to 66, and uh, we just had to walk into the teacher hiring, and they would say, okay, I want you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so you got your job first, and I, you said to them, well, my wife wants a job too. I said, oh, okay, <laughs> walk me over here. <laughs> we'll take you there. The, so I went to West Hill. The and the, the other thing about them was the staffs were young. Now, this was very young staff. The average teaching experience in Scarborough in the mid '60s was two years. We, we, we thought we thought the department heads were old. The department heads were probably 35. I, my bet is uh, my bet is I, I wouldn't want to guarantee you this, but at Woburn, I would bet that um, yeah, Sheila, you're at your head. She was 28. She was 28. Yeah. <laughs> Which was a very different experience from the 80s, because by that time the whole thing had frozen. Right? That's right, absolutely. Yeah. So the staffs get older and older and older right from this period on. Uh, and of course the experience rate goes up, but of course as the experience goes right, rate goes up, so does the gap between the teachers and students, uh, and so does the burnout rate. 
Right. So I mean, now everybody's talking about retiring. Every, every yeah. time I talk to a teacher who's got my age, they're all talking about retiring. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Bob and Wynn were not the only people to remind me of the euphoria of education expansion in the '60s. Many of my classmates finished up in education. Pat Hipgrave went on to become an English teacher at the school she had left only four years before. Sharon Thurston, another ex-classmate, also did her BA in teacher training and joined the education system. When I filmed them in the winter of 2001, they were both on the verge of retiring. I guess the thing that I remember, or that now I value, is that there were people there who understood adolescence and could provide an opportunity for adolescents to grow and to be who they are. And I remember one time, I guess just maybe in, in high school, it was an opportunity to, to learn to stand up for your rights and object to things. <laughs> maybe this is part of the teenage rebellion and maybe it was just yeah. part of the 60s. But I can remember one time being very <coughs> indignant about a teacher we had who we really did not feel was a very good teacher, and especially because we'd had a, a teacher the previous year for the same subject who had been absolutely superb. And I remember marching myself into the office and insisting that I would see the vice principal well, or I principal. I know who you're talking about. <laughs> and, and, and just laying out mm -hmm. what I thought and being given the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what sometimes people don't appreciate about high school teachers. They have to be able to deal with that kind of emotional mm. black and white that sometimes adolescents see. But it was the opportunity to stand up. There were no repercussions after it. Nobody did a suspension. It was just, mm. this is part of growing up. These are basically good kids. Mm. Let's not worry about it. Let's just go on. And I'm not sure that the general public always realizes that this, this is a gift that people who deal with adolescents have. And if you don't have it, you really shouldn't stay teaching, <laughs> and you really aren't going to have much of an influence. This is Doris Garb and Jim and Sharon. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Ross. I can't Contrary to the warm feelings Pat and Sharon expressed, I hadn't really enjoyed my high school years. They're right about one thing, though. The academic teaching hadn't stuck out in my mind. It mostly involved memorizing and reproducing information from textbooks, as far as I could remember. I guess the most permanent influence was that it got me started off in French. No, the strongest memories are about the feelings of being included in, or excluded from, this or that clan of possible friends. Invariably, the ones you felt excluded from were more attractive than the guys you were hanging around with, not to mention the problems I had with girls at the time. If I happened to be attracted to them, they scared me shitless. Still, I got interested in the period again when my mother, who keeps sending me Toronto Star clippings, told me in 1999 they were talking of closing Midland. To me, that seemed absurd. Midland may not have been, for me at any rate, much of a social experience, but there is no doubt it was a great public building, and when I occasionally walked by it on my trips home, it seemed like new. Plus, the idea of closing an educational facility just rubs the wrong way. I mean, we as a generation grew up believing in the virtues of continuing education for all, not just kids, but working adults, old people, everybody. It was part of the ethos of the time. And if life since then has taught me one thing, it's that society at large needs a lot more shared culture, intelligence, more capacity to think things out, certainly not less. All right, let's go in. So why were they closing it? Was anybody fighting the idea? Weren't there any alternatives? Having spent much of the last 30 years making social documentary, I decided to pick up my camera and explore these questions. I went to the final reunion, organized June 3, 2000. I met up with a number of people, including Duncan Green, who was busy collecting signatures for a future association, Cal Francis and Brian Sanborn, alumni and teachers. Above the hubbub and the noise of the crowd, they gave me a round of ideas about the whys and wherefores of the closing, and this stimulated my curiosity. So, starting with their statement of things, I set out to talk to more people, trying to understand in detail what was at stake 
and what really had happened. This film is a record of my inquiry and a trace of the answers that I found. I should add that among other things Duncan Green salvaged from the garbage was a series of cassettes recording aspects of Midland life. Some of the images you will see come from the rushes of a 1992 school-made promotion video entitled Midland, A Great Experience. The lovely space that we have at the front of the room here. And the light. The, the light, the beautiful cafeteria, I've forgotten about that. The halls. The halls are wide. Do you know that the halls are wide in that shot? That's right. Most schools are most schools. Man, and I like the fact that they put in benches. Now, to, hi. <laughs> they put benches in here for kids to sit. Some of the newer schools don't have the kind of space that this has. And it's, it's really too bad that we're actually losing it. Well, I'm Duncan Green, and I went to Midland in the 60s, I think 1963 to 68. I think like a lot of kids, uh, the early years are, of high school are the most tumultuous that, you know, I didn't participate a whole lot, but I did in the later years, starting in 11 and, and more so in 12 and 13. And, uh, and, you know, perhaps when you're in the middle of things, you don't think of it this way, but looking back, uh, I think it was tremendously important in terms of the uh, friendships, in terms of my learning. Uh, and uh, I look back very fondly to those years. That uh, Not that I would head back there at all, but I think it was an important part of my, uh, my youth and uh, my experience. What was your reaction when you heard of the news of closing the school? And I certainly knew that there were going to be downsizings and cutbacks in the schools, but I, when it was actually my high school that was closing, I thought, well, initially that's a shame because it removes the physical context uh, by which people who graduated from that school can get together, and so there's no central focus anymore. And I guess I felt a bit orphaned as well that, you know, your high school is not supposed to close, it's not supposed to become obsolete. It's supposed to be always there to go back to. <laughs> and uh, even though I only went back for reunions, uh, it was somehow comforting to know that it was there. So where are you living now? North Carolina. Oh yeah? The Outer Banks. Good. And um, we love people visiting, so if you want to come down, come on down. People, you gotta look at their name tags to see who they are. <laughs> and then do you we have realized, fond memories of this place, David. And then, yeah, I do. Yeah, there's a lot of fun here. We uh, right up here is where they used to do gymnastics, and um, they strategi strategically placed it so high that you would fall over the edge while holding a horse, <laughs> which was always a fear of God. And down here is where we wrote all the exams, right here. And um, when I went there in 1970 to teach, there were 2,300 students, uh, about 150 people on the staff, 14 portables in addition to the, the building that existed. Over the next 10 years, from 1970 to 1980, the school population gradually fell due to the fact that our parents were still living in their houses and no longer had school-age kids. So that age group or that generation was not moving out of the area and therefore no one was moving into the area. And um, so the school population was falling and I, it must have been sometime in the 80s when the, the first uh, discussion of closure was going on. And of course it wasn't happening just 
at Midland. It was happening in all of the high schools in the southern part of Scarborough. Anyway, there was a huge hue and cry that arose at Midland. I can remember as, as one of the people on the staff at that time going up to the Scarborough board offices and sitting in the, uh, the board meetings and there was um, uh, plea after plea, you know, uh, students would speak to the school board, the, the trustees, uh, parents, uh, teachers, uh, former students, and th the most heartfelt things were, were coming from these people about what Midland Collegiate had done for, for either them personally or for their children or for their, the neighborhood, or a, as a staff person, um, and uh, it, it turned the tide, it, it changed mm -hmm. the board's decision. Uh, they, they did not close Midland or any of the other schools at that time, they decided to let them run. Was, um, was there any effect when we moved from what were the academic, the commercial, and the tech courses to a general level kind of course where the shows mm -hmm. were used as much? Yes, I think that was a factor. There, there was definitely a decline in the shop use and certainly in the staffing of the school. The shop teachers were often the ones that were on the, you know, the surplus mm -hmm. list because of course people did not want to see their kids going into what they considered these blue collar jobs they didn't stop to think about the fact that you do need somebody to fix your car mm -hmm. and now your computer <laughs> not everybody can be a com mm -hmm. computer engineer some people have to fix the darn things there was one question that intrigued me about the drop-in enrollment at the school the school population had not only dropped it had also radically changed was the fact that Midland and its neighborhood now attracted so many recent immigrants a factor, directly or indirectly, in its closing? I tried to find some people from the generation between the 60s and today. People who graduated in the 80s or early 90s and who could tell me about the transition. After an article appeared in the Scarborough Mirror about this project, I was contacted by Colleen McIntyre who put me in touch with the student leaders of her generation, the Cartsonis sisters, Liz and Amalia, and an ex-football captain and student council president, Andy Samponia. Okay, well, my name is Amalia Cartsonis, and mm -hmm. I was a Midland student from 1985 to 1990. So, a good five years at the school. I've you did grade 13, right? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, you had to do grade 13 at the time to proceed... Well, it was called OAC. Then. OAC, exactly, to proceed into university. And that's why you proceeded? That's where I proceeded. I went to York University afterwards as uh -huh. a communications major. And I'm Colleen McIntyre. I went for, to Midland from 1985 to 1989 and I didn't take any OACs because I wasn't planning on going to university. <laughs> uh, I after went on to college and studied radio and TV broadcasting. I've been, I've been staring in front of a computer for the last three hours, so my mind is blank. Okay. All right. So let's do that again. Okay. Can, you, can you tell me your name, please, and when you were at Midland? Certainly. Um, my name is Andy Sampogna, and I'm a Midland alumnus. I commenced at Midland. Actually, commencement. I shouldn't be saying that, should I? I started at Midland, you can say. <laughs> I'm just going to say, from 86 to, to 1990. Well, I started out just basically taking general studies and um, really didn't have a focus or goals in mind but I wanted to mm -hmm. you know, succeed I wanted to go to university um, from grade 9 I joined a student council and followed my student council career right up into student council president in my last two years mm -hmm. and uh, in that time as well while I was playing sports I've always showed leadership abilities and uh, I was always called upon to, to captain either the hockey team or the football team or the rugby team. You were in all of these? You were in I was team? involved in all sports. All sports? Curling from curling to baseball. 
We were talking about the um, about the drop in school population. So yes, it, it went from what to what, more or less. I mean, it doesn't have to be the. Uh, when we it entered, is probably at, at 1700. Yeah. And uh, this by the, is 85, right? This is 85, and by the time I graduated in 90, it I would say a good 800 students at that time. So you, you would guess that it lost about a thousand students. Yes. Over the five years. Yes. Okay, so one reason dem demography. Yes, definitely. But was it the only reason? No, I don't think that was the only reason. I just think that um, the school is definitely cater to a different demographic obviously um, we had a lot of ESL students we introduced a basic level program we had advanced general and a basic uh, level program was introduced when we were I believe in grade 10 or 11 and I think that hindered uh, Midland's reputation of becoming a very high academically inclined school plus we had lost a lot of money for um, sports and extracurricular activities um, not enough money was being supported for our school teams. Yeah. So I think that also, if you're a student wanting to find a really great high school, have great experience, um, I think in the late, mid to late 80s, Millen was in the place to go for a great, uh, to play football, to play soccer, because you wouldn't get a scholarship, because not a lot of agents would come. And I think the same academically, um, because there's a lot of, uh, ESL students, a lot of basic level students, and the more focus was what was on the ESL because of the demographic, that um, there's only very few students taking advanced courses, a lot of them taking general courses. So um, it was not a school to be catered or promoted as a high ap academic or high um, sports. So what does that mean? That means that the, the kids who wanted, um, who wanted the um Academic qualifications went to King, or the kids who went yeah. to the sports went to Churchill. Or yeah, exactly. How did it? How did it? King was very popular. Um, sports was also Porter, yeah. Churchill, um, Wexford was a big one too. Yeah. Um, for arts, yeah. and uh, those are the ones that really stick out in my mind. So in fact, what's happening is that schools are competing for students, basically. Yes. Is that what it is? I think so. Yeah. The basement of our school, a lot of the classes. Um, we, that basement was notorious for shop classes and then as soon as when the basic level and the ESL students came in the whole basement was taken over by those classes and I felt there was kind of a, of a hierarchy or a structure taking place here yeah. uh, that's how I felt like nobody really associated with those students taking the basic the basic and ESL students stuck together in, in the clique and it kind of there was a there's a distinct separation mm -hmm. I, I witnessed during the latter years before I graduated. Yeah. It wasn't evident when I was in from 85 to 87 because those programs were not introduced as uh, at that time. Yeah. And they and they trucked a lot of um, a lot of students in as well from other schools. Yes. So for the once, ESL program. Exactly. Before I arrived uh, in terms of athletics the school was fairly strong. In my first two years at Midland, our uh, football teams did really well, and the atmosphere around football, and a lot of the guys were great. Uh, in the last couple of years, it, it just sort of fell apart, and programs started to uh, cancel. Uh, we didn't have issues with strikes like they do nowadays, but we just had issues of just you know trying to get bodies out to play a lot of these sports, or for that matter, join the athletic. Uh, and student councils. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this was a result of the declining enrollment. Or? I agree. I, th I believe it was. Um, uh, at the time, the school adopted a, a basic program as well, and uh, uh, prior to that, it was just basically general and advanced studies. But the hope was, and I'm, I'm guessing here, that it was to just increase enrollment by allowing basic studies into the school. And that might have done two things at the school. It might have helped it, which I don't think it had, or it might have brought a certain element to the school that, that might have caused a decline. Um, I mean, these students at times are very disrupt disruptive and yeah. weren't really there to school. You know, for school talking about, somebody was telling me about segregation of the school population, that sort of stuff? Hey, that's exactly what occurred. Yes. And, uh, I mean, and the basic studies was just part of it, but it was also just, you know, part of the, you know, Scarborough's population at the time. Mm. It was certainly um, it's a changing 
area and um, a lot of the population base that used to attend Midland um, in terms of uh, ethnicities, Italians, the Greeks, uh, uh, the white Anglo-Saxons, had just you know, moved on into the regions and a lot of the population, you know, Midland's population uh, just didn't play sports or didn't participate in, in school life and school activity. So it would make school life very boring, very dry. Mm. And hence, if, if schools, you know, not a place, I mean, I mean, obviously it's a place, you know, to educate yourselves, but it's also a place to, you know, to remain social and to, to hang out with your friends and to, enjoy yourself. Mm. Um, it's a learning experience. You know, you know, whether it be academic or whether it be social, it's, it's an experience you have to enjoy. Mm. And uh, it just wasn't enjoyable. Was violence a problem? There have been stories. It depends on the person you talk to. There's yeah. some people who say that there was a problem with violence and some people say there's no problem with violence. You well, I don't think violence and... really, it didn't really um, happen. Like, it didn't really happen to our group of people. But, I mean, there was a lot of violence there. I mean, we've seen fights in the washrooms. Fights um, in the hallway, right I, in front of I saw a girl actually put a guy's head through the trophy case one day, and there was mm. a lot of... There well, was a lot I, of violence. Yeah, I saw one guy getting stabbed by another right in the front hallway as yeah. soon as you walked into the school. There was always fights at those dances, too. Uh, Every okay, dance, yes. there was a fight. <laughs> Every dance, there was a fight. <laughs> Not, I, I can't think of any weapons being used, but definitely yeah. a lot of fists yeah. were flying. And the fights were between who and who, and what was the stake? I mean, what were they fighting about? Uh, there was a lot of times guys from other schools would come and, yes. and fight with, with, our, with our guys. I wouldn't say it was gang related no. or anything like that. Um, I, I think it was just a, a, a fight of egos or girlfriends. Yeah. yeah. Girls were a lot of cause of a lot of fights. Yes. But uh, I remember one dance we had, there was a rock thrown through. Uh, we used to have the oh, dances yes. in, the, in the cafeteria. That's right. And there was a rock thrown through the window and somebody got injured because the rock hit them in the head. Uh, those dances were a lot of fun. <laughs> Besides the violence <laughs> that we witnessed and all the fights. But at the end of the day, they stopped giving these dances, didn't they? they yes, they did. Them. And they started having them in the gym after. Yes, exactly. They had um, and a lot earlier, that. too. Mm -hmm. They weren't at night anymore. Yeah, no, they were like Friday afternoon or something after yes, school. After and then, school. of course, no, who wants to go to a dance after school school? That was uh, the problem with the morale thing again. Um, a lot of people just didn't want to go because it was in the afternoon and it wasn't as fun because it wasn't in the cafeteria anymore, you know? And it was um, closed in, you couldn't see outside and you couldn't go, come and go as you pleased. Yeah, um, yeah they started becoming um, very strict and very stringent about um, a student's activities and how one has to um, present themselves or walk down the hallway. I understand. The teachers, the teachers, principals, the staff. The staff. Mm -hmm. I think it's out of fear. They want mm -hmm. and they also want to maintain control of the school. That would also turn a lot of students off from going there as well. Yeah. And I understand a year after I graduated, they started implementing a hall pass program, and uh, that was never heard of no. when we were there. No. We were, if you were in the hallway, you were questioned why you were there, but never given a hall pass. I think that they were trying to maintain con a control of the students mm -hmm. and by implementing uh, such um, methods of having dances in the afternoon and and having hall passes so no violence or, or bad behavior would erupt. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that it hindered a lot of students from ha actually having fun and mm -hmm. from other students coming in and, and saying, wow, I'd like to go to this great school. So yeah. I got the idea yeah. of the reputation of the school altogether. Finally, I talked with some teachers of the final decade who gave me yet a different perspective. Sharon Hershenhorn invited me to her house on East Queen. And then, through Brian Sanborn, teacher librarian, and Sasikaran Loganathan, both of whom were at David and Mary Thompson Collegiate, I was able to film a discussion that included Bruce Elliott, another Midland transferred to Thompson. Uh, Bruce Elliott, I was a business studies teacher at Midland. Uh, I was there from 1990 to the closing, and uh, now I'm teaching here at uh, David and Mary Thompson. Well, I was there, I guess, a total of about um, eight or nine years. I, um, I took a little bit of a trip uh, in the middle of it and went to Mowat on a acting position and then 
it was my choice and I came back to Midland mm -hmm. after that. It was, um, it was enjoyable. It was almost like a family. I got to know, of course, the staff very well, staying there for nine years. You get to know the core staff. We had a lot of people come in and out during that period, but it was a very solid group of people. And, of course, they had a strong uh, dedication to the students and to the community that they were part of. Uh, you would walk through the community, as I did every day, and and you'd always greet people. They'd, they'd say hello, they'd ask you how the school was. A lot of new Canadians, uh, a lot of people, uh, we had a, a very good ESL program that uh, allowed a lot of new Canadians to, to integrate into the school. And uh, I remember many instances where I had students who came in at maybe grade 9 or grade 10 with very little language ability. And by the time they finished at Midland, they were ready to go to university. And not only ready, they were ahead of many people because many of them had received higher level scholarships from U of T, York, and, and offers from other universities around the province. I think when you make that kind of a progress in such a short time, it, it shows that first you have the energy and secondly you have the support necessary to do the job. And I see that Midland was uh, very good at that. They, they did a good job of, of encouraging people to, to aspire to their, their, their abilities and, and to their objectives and goals. And that was one of the real strengths, is that it was a stepping up institution. It allowed a lot of people to, to move from where they were when they came into the country so that they were ready to enter mainstream society and education by the time they got through it. My name is Sharon Hershenhorn, yeah. and I was a teacher and head of modern languages at Midland Avenue Collegiate between 1990 and the year 2000 when the school closed. Um, I've been a teacher for about 27 years, uh, 19 of those years in the former Scarborough Board of Education, which was then amalgamated into the Toronto District School Board. Um, when I came to Midland in September 1990, it was my very first promotion. I became a head of department at Midland Avenue Collegiate, so I was very excited to be there. It really was uh, an exciting time for the school and for me professionally. I uh, made a lot of wonderful friends. Could not believe the students there. A uh, very small school even when I first arrived, always under a thousand. We had adults, we had special needs students, we had a lot of English as second language students. Many, many different nationalities, many different languages, uh, both in the classroom and in the hallways. The students seemed to function as their own peer helpers. So if there were two students in my class from Afghanistan, they would make sure that they sat together and they would help each other. I taught a beginner's French program there and I learned a lot about the students and their their former countries and why they came to Canada and this was all sort of subliminal to teaching them French I was learning they were learning about French they were learning about Canadian culture and I was in turn learning about them as people as recent immigrants to Canada as um, new students at Midland how they were trying to uh, acclimatize themselves to their new country how they were learning about French as the second founding culture of Canada, their new adoptive country. We had two citizenships courts run right in the school, in the auditorium, where students who had been studying um, civics actually took the oath to become Canadian citizens. And those ceremonies were opened up to Midland staff. And although I was born and raised in Canada, I retook my oath of citizenship and I was so proud to have done that with students and and staff members at Midland. When I came there my colleagues said are you sure you really want to go to Midland? It's it's a really bad school and I said what do you mean by bad school? Very violent school really really bad kids go there and I found it to be exactly the opposite. Kids were quote normal what I would had it what I would have expected at any high school anywhere in any of the uh, city schools. It was an inner city school, but there was no more violence than I had been exposed to at any other school that I taught at. And prior to coming to Midland, I taught at four other collegiates in the former Scarborough Board. It was no different. We had planned as a committee, before school closure was even an idea, I think, 
to um, draw students to us by our international focus. We had considered uh, international baccalaureate and I was part of the team that went out to do some research on schools which were uh, schools in Ontario, not just Toronto, but in Ontario that were offering the IB program. And uh, Midland was well along in the process. We had written our proposal, we had gone to the community, we had gone to the board, former Scarborough board, but at that time the, um, the guillotine dropped and we were on the closure list of 138 schools. And, and This was 98. Yeah, everybody backed off. We had received approval from the IB committee to proceed with our application. Uh, the United Nations had granted us its flag and they've, they've only done that I think twice before in North America. And we flew that flag very proudly on our, on our flagpole out front of the school. Um, I had received um, verbal confirmation from Glendon, Glendon College, which offers programs in French and in Spanish at the university level. They had expressed interest in our uh, IB proposal and had said they would love to offer programs at Midland, which would grant our students advanced placement when they eventually got to Glendon. I know there were other initiatives in the work, but those were the ones that I can speak that about from you. personal experience. I felt the future was bright for Midland, I really did. To find out more about this idea of a funding formula the Harris government had developed and that schools like Midland didn't fit into, I moved both west and east. West to London, where Bob Gidney lives in a comfortable house with his wife and fellow researcher Wynne Miller. Bob wrote the book, From Hope to Harris, The History of the Education System Over the Past Fifty Years. And east, along Highway 7 to Ottawa, where Jeff Kendall, former trustee for the Midland Ward, told me how he saw things as one of the people who voted for the closure and who stood by their decision. Uh, I'm Jeff Kendall, yeah. uh, former school trustee from Scarborough and presently a law student at the University of Ottawa. Okay. You've been a law student for how long? Uh, in 1999. Two years I've been. When were you elected to the Board of Education? 1994, the first time. Uh, and that was to the Scarborough Board of Education. Uh -huh. And then in 1997, I was elected for the next three years to the Toronto District School Board. Okay, so just explain to me, you were elected to represent a particular area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were elected, I was elected in uh, the first time around to represent what was called Ward 5, yeah. which was the constituency within Scarborough. There were 14 of them. Uh, and the second time, uh, the school boards within metropolitan Toronto had merged into one. Uh, so the, the ward I represented grew and it became Scarborough City Centre. The reaction against the school boards begins in the very late 80s but gathers enormous momentum in the early 90s. And there you're not talking about the Harris government, you're talking about an NDP government. Uh, the, the reaction by the, the hostility on the part of huge proportions of the citizenry mm -hmm. and a lot of the politicians who were, who were taking the flak to, to what the school boards are um, purportedly doing is pretty extreme. Uh, Dave Cook, after all, was, was, was Minister of Education in a social democratic government, and he was appalled by the school boards, and it's Dave Cook who, first, who, who initiates the policy of stripping the school boards of much of their power and amalgamating them. And that's because there were boards in the minority probably, but they were the big Toronto boards, the boards that get all the press, the boards where, uh, where, where their activities are reported in Toronto papers which are read across the province, like classically the Star, and which would follow these events closely. The final turning point actually is the Scarborough story in 92 when the Scarborough trustees, remember now we're talking about at the height of a depression in Ontario. Mm -hmm the most serious recession we experienced since the 30s. The height of that recession, the Scarborough trustees voted themselves a 60% raise. And the people of Scarborough, the property owners, just exploded because they've been seeing their tax go, uh, their property taxes rise and sometimes double digits annually, year after year after year, to pay for the uh, programs. And that wasn't entirely the trustees' fault, by the way. But there were incidents like that that just exploded all over the press and had the media calling for action and the politicians uh, just shaking their shaking their heads and rolling their eyes uh, over this. Uh, initially it was, I saw it as an opportunity to get involved in public service 
and uh, politics has always interested me since I was quite young. And it was really a good, it's a good level to get in and you know, begin a bit of a career in politics. It's, it's small and local enough that you can sort out what your style is, you get to know people very well and you get to uh, you know, test the waters a little bit and see if it's right for you. Uh, looking back, it was a good experience uh, because I learned a lot of skills and you know, techniques and that that I wouldn't pick up anywhere else and, and will never have an opportunity to experience again. You know, public debating uh, in a forum, uh, in a democratic forum like that, uh, where there's no right and wrong, it's the consensus building. Uh, just an opportunity to meet literally thousands of people in the community uh, and find out what's important to them. You get, you get to know your community a lot better to deal with some of the big provincial issues that, that we were facing at the time. And we were Looking back, at the beginning I didn't realize what I was going to be part of. Looking back, I was part of a great upheaval. It's not something I would want to be part of, but having been part of it, looking back at what happened, it certainly was a valuable experience and lets you get a different perspective on how decisions are made. The notion of a funding formula arose from a central problem that arises with the kind of financial arrangements that have been traditional in both Canada and the United States, where the sources of funding come from both the state or provincial government and from local school boards raised on the, the local rates, the property tax. So in other words, if you, if you just consider the residential tax base, you've got built-in inequalities of opportunity. Just because the kid is born in a rural township, uh, or, or say, in, a, in, in northern Ontario, those kids are going to have less resources at their command, per, per pupil basis, than you are in Toronto or London or Ottawa, so, so the richer boards in Ontario. Now, how do you get around that? And the answer was increasingly, you can't. Okay? So the compromise in Ontario for the last 30 years has been the government would give grants to, uh, to each school board, and they would attempt to equalize. There'd be an equalization formula. The, the, the government would attempt to give more grants to poorer boards, less grants to rich boards. The problem was that that really didn't address the issue. You could bring all the poor boards up to a minimum standard, but Toronto could just keep taxing and taxing and taxing its local residents, and, and so that there's still be vast disparities between the big urban boards and most of the rest of the province. So the solution that the experts came up with again and again in reports was the only way you're going to give equality of opportunity across this province is to really substantially restrict the power of local boards, tax. The Fair Tax Commission in Ontario, anything but a, uh, but a Tory plot, let me tell you, deliberately set up to reform the tax in a more equitable manner by a social democratic government, that report came up uh, calling for the virtue, the virtual abolition of the power to local tax. They were going to leave no more than 10% above budget in the hands of local boards. Right? Now, what they were recommending was restriction on local boards and at the same time the development of a funding formula which was fair and equitable across the province. What that means is you start estimating the costs of all the specifics that go into creating a, a good school. The cost of space, the cost of program, the cost of teacher salaries. And you look for an optimum or average uh, figure, and that becomes your basic funding formula. I felt that Bob Gidney was giving me a very positive spin on the funding formula idea. It sounded almost as if he had been one of those experts on the expert panels he had talked about. So I tried to get another point of view from another source. And following leads or reading articles, I finally ended up at the source of all those fabled newspaper clippings. Yes, the hallowed press room of the Toronto Star, one of the few serious countervailing powers in Ontario politics. I am Trish Crawford with the Toronto Star. I'm a feature writer. I write in the Life section currently, but I have also covered Queen's Park, City Hall, Board of Education. And why, why these changes? There's, there's two uh, goals. One is the province wants to save money. The second thing is a philosophy that the student in Welland is the same as the student in North Bay is the same as the student in Toronto. Ontario hosts half of all new Canadians and Toronto hosts the bulk of them and as well as the 905 area right around it. 
There are 530 students in an area of Toronto called Rexdale who start a kindergarten, junior kindergarten, with English as a second language, and yet they're born in Canada. One in five children in Toronto is raised in family below the poverty line. That means something. It means something that the schools have to catch up to. There's breakfast programs. Recreational programs are twinned to many, many schools. They are the heart of all the activity that these families participate in. They don't have money for clubs and other memberships. They rely on the school board to provide these. The, all the pupils don't come to school armed equally with the same ability to succeed. And you have to spend more to level the playing field for some. Virtually every panel that studied this matter uh, said there's a case to be made for equality across the province. There's a case to be made for central funding. But we also got to remember the politics of local autonomy. It's important that local boards have the power to make decisions uh, within limits. So the proposal was always to leave the boards with 5%, 10% power to tax. In other words, you could raise uh, 5 to 10% from your residential rate payers uh, above what you got from the government. The Tory government made the decision to wipe that out. All the funding was to be determined by Queen's Park. We don't know exactly why they opted uh, to go against the advice of successive uh, expert uh, panels, but they did. And consequently, we now find ourselves in a situation where the only money the Scarborough Board has at its command for the first time in our history is the money it receives from the provincial government. Gail Nyberg, chair of the TDSB at the time the decision was taken, has a house in the former township of East York. She took a half an hour from her work on the Canadian census to talk to me. The history goes back prior to amalgamation. We, uh, we amalgamated all of the six area boards into one in January 98. Prior to that, it's my understanding that the former Scarborough board had looked at Midland as a possible closure because it was, it had a low enrollment base, but I think most importantly it also had a lower enrollment base in the high schools that surrounded it. When amalgamation came forward, all of the area boards basically stopped with any planning and worked on bringing these boards together. In March 1998, we had a new funding formula that came from the province, and the way the way it, the, the square footage was calculated, it appeared that the Toronto District School Board had 11 million square feet. At that point, we knew very, very well that we didn't have 11 million square feet in excess, but the formula was devised in such a way that that's how our numbers came up. So the board lobbied the government for a long time to try to get them to change the funding formula. and. We hit roadblock over and over and over again. So a plan was devised by the board to actually take the government's own formula and roll it out. And we began to compile a list of schools that you would close if you were trying to remove 11 million square feet. What happened is we came up with a list of 138, which only actually removed 8 million square feet. Because what happened when you applied this really stupid formula we could no longer play students. And what our staff did was they said, okay, we're gonna to try to do this, and but we all, whenever we're gonna close a school, in theory, we have to be able to place the students. When they got to eight million square feet that they had removed on this list of 138 schools, they could no longer place any students. And the board announced that list, and it threw this community, Toronto, into a tizzy. But what happened was... Was that intentional, the TV? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely <laughs> it was intentional. It was intentional. And, I, and I, can, I can tell you, Michael, when we got the list of schools on the Saturday in an information session, the board was all behind this plan to do this mm. uh, because we knew we had to prove to this government they were wrong and they don't have a history of listening. So it had to be pretty dramatic. And boards across the province were facing the same difficulty. But I understand when you live in Toronto, you have the press in your backyard and we are so much bigger than any other board 
uh, that our numbers are staggering. When I looked at the list and I looked at the formula and how it worked on the Saturday before, I can remember saying to one of our facilities people, my gosh, this formula is so stupid and it's so simply stupid that even the press are going to get it. And when the press get it, the government is going to be forced to change this. So on October 29th, the board announced these 138 schools and it took six days. Six days of public pressure and just uh, like it, like the, the community was up in an up uproar before the government said, okay, okay, you made your point, and they amended the formula in the ways that we talked about. And when the formula was amended, it put $54 million back into the Toronto District School Board budget on a yearly basis. But I think what one of the reasons Scarborough was on the first, uh, or Midland was on the first list, is because it did have a large square footage. It could bring you closer to your goal, but it did have a number of high schools surrounding Midland that uh, that could receive the kids, and also uh, certainly. All of the experts have, have said to me, I'm not a teacher and I don't purport to be, but I do know a little bit about organizing high schools. And when you have 650, 700 students, uh, it, there's some good situations, but you also limit the, the offerings of, of courses and curriculum that can be offered. The optimal size of a high school is about 1,200 and uh, it, it gets a little crazy after it's 2000 and at 600 those students were uh, losing out on some of the options. I was just mulling over in my mind the notion that there might be a dark side to all those sunny Canadian lawns and tidy houses when suddenly there was a scream. The bus I was traveling back from Ottawa lurched to a quick stop. Somebody had thrown themselves out the window a distraught teenager apparently trying to commit suicide. Everybody got out. We were quickly surrounded by OPP, stuck at Highway Junction 7 and 38 until well after sunset. I felt I was lost in a punch-drunk road movie. The driver had to be replaced. A passenger who had witnessed the scene was too shaken to continue the journey. She went back to Ottawa. To talk about the effects of the cuts in education, I just had to walk down the street from where I was staying on Barton Avenue. There, amid animals, musical instruments, and yet another cozy Toronto house, I met a feisty, thoughtful, committed lady. My name's Annie Kidder, and I'm with a group called People for Education. We began as a part of the parent association at my children's school, a committee of the parent association at my children's school. And we began when the principal came and asked us for, to raise money for math textbooks. And we were uh, surprised at having to raise money for math textbooks. We always knew you know, parents raise money for various sort of extras, but we were really concerned about what it meant to the, to the idea of public education when parents uh, raised money for what we'd always considered basics, things that your taxes are supposed to pay for. What did it mean to the idea of fairness? You know, it was fine for our school where we could raise the money, but what happened in other schools where mm -hmm. they couldn't raise the money didn't mean they just didn't get any math books. So we started a committee that, you know, we said we'd raise the money, but as hard as we worked raising the money, we'd work to let it be known that we thought this was wrong. And that committee, that was in 1995, in the fall of 1995. and. Just at the same time, the the newly elected had been elected in June of that year. Conservative government announced its first cuts to public education, and so then we started talking to parents in other schools, and we were concerned about what those cuts would do. And then we grew from there, and since then have become now we're a provincial organization. We have a provincial focus, and we send a newsletter out to all the schools in Ontario now, and we run a tracking project. We decided it was important that, that somebody be tracking the effects of all the changes on the mm -hmm. school so that we wanted to make sure that there was a way of keeping track of what happened when you made these cuts or made these kind of policy changes and that you made the connection between policy changes and their effects. In terms of the rules changing, I guess I think the first rule that changed was that was a kind of an assumption of a commitment to public education that that I grew up with as a you know good Canadian 
uh, citizen, what, an, an assumption that it would always be there and that it was really important that you had to fund it adequately and, um, and that you had to try and make it fair. It was never completely fair. There was always more stuff in schools in affluent neighborhoods. But that, that was the assumption that we all worked with, I think. And I think when this government was first elected, the first thing they did was appoint an education minister who hadn't graduated from high school, and nothing against not graduating from high school, but it's a sort of sign of how you feel about um, these, you know, kind of the importance of public education. And he seemed to feel that here am I, I'm a self-made man, I'm a millionaire, I didn't need to finish high school. And, and it's kind of been downhill since then. And that they look at, you know, the other part, the other part of the rule change is that instead of having an education policy that they developed, they wanted to make all these changes, they got a, elected on this sort of re common sense revolution idea. Um, instead of going, okay, we're going to have a revolution in education too, and we're going to look at all the programs in education and kind of build a new education system from the ground up, they just looked at it as a fiscal problem. And really what they looked at it as, how cheap a system can we get away with? And the numbers that they used were based on very bogus averages and were not enough. They also developed this notion of the classroom, of what's inside the classroom and outside the classroom, and that things that were outside the classroom were expendable. So, and their notion of what was in the classroom was a teacher was inside the classroom and the students and what the sort of basic student needs were inside the classroom and nothing else. So you just had a teacher in a field the the classroom itself wasn't inside the classroom. Funding the, the heat, the light, the principal, the library, um, nothing else was inside the classroom. And so when they, the first they made that arbitrary division between inside and outside and then they said everything outside the classroom is is those are expensive expenses that can be cut more you know we can really tighten that up there's too much fat so once you decide that and you you narrow the funding that much you can't keep all the schools open and what we're seeing is uh, schools that either aren't full by their notion of full but also small schools close because their formula doesn't allow for small schools they big schools are more efficient right you get really a lot of kids in a school and you still only need one principal and one librarian if you can have a librarian um, so it's still all based on fiscal it's all just based on money it's not based on there's been no study done to say every community needs a school or a neighborhood needs a school or but doesn't this um, call into question a little bit the role of the boards because theoretically they're supposed to be the place where the local community has power over mm -hmm. education decisions I mean, yeah, but if you take away their control over money, I mean, if you don't give boards, if you say to a board, you can stay there and be a board, we're not going to pay any of your trustees and we're not going to give you any control over money, they can't really do anything. I mean, they, our argument was resign, you know, quit en masse, say we refuse to do this, have a revolution. Boards aren't usually very revolutionary, though. Um, Yes, school boards are there to represent you know, local needs and to take care of the needs of their community and that's what they're supposed to do. And I think they've all tried really hard to do that, but they're completely, they're beyond constrained. You know, they're handcuffed by, by no funding and by, by a real restriction on where that money can go. There's no flexibility either to move money around. To grant this school board good intentions, I think it saw this as the best solution was to close the 30 schools they're going to close um, and the, with the least suffering. You could argue against that. <laughs> um, there had up to, before amalgamation, there was a policy in the Toronto board. We, we also amalgamated seven boards, right? I mean, we're dealing with a lot of different things at the same time. There was a policy to not close schools. It was a board policy and they just didn't close them because the population changes and it's you know not sensible to close schools. Adult education was an important factor in the school. Wasn't Very it? much so and I remember that I remember during some of the articles that there was a debate about how the adults were counted, whether they were counted. They weren't or... counted. They were simply removed when we were counting heads for the funding formula. The um, provincial government, the uh, provincial conservative government that was elected in 1995 slashed our numbers arbitrarily by saying we could not count the adults, we could not count the cosmetology, which was a thriving program and included both adolescents and adults, and we were absolutely not able to count the Section 27, which 
These are special students, most of whom have been withdrawn from the courts from their homes, placed in group homes, but the courts wanted to maintain their, the continuity of their education, so they would be placed in special classrooms until the program directors deemed that they were ready to be integrated into a regular classroom. And I, as a teacher, I was fortunate enough to come in contact not only with the program but with several students who were successfully integrated into my classes. They were absolutely not allowed and so our enrollment dropped from just below 1,900 to 800 to six, 700 to down as low as 600 at one point. And it was like they were tightening the noose around our necks. They weren't taken into account because one of the things that happened at the same time that the funding model came in is the government changed the entire way that adult education was funded. Prior to amalgamation and prior to the funding formula, adults in regular day schools were funded at the same level as a 16-year-old, which was about 6,500. At the formula, any adult edu education, any education for a person over 21 was funded on the continuing education formula, which is $2,257, with no provision whatsoever for facilities. And so to count them was a nice option, but it was not an option that, that, that the board could do because there was no funding for them. So they were in there and it continued to even be a, a bigger draw on the budget. So much as most of the trustees on, on that former board that I was on valued adult education, they knew that uh, that they couldn't count those numbers because they weren't receiving any facilities funding for adult learners. But how does that jive with the with the business of the education society and the well, doesn't information jive. technology and all of this? Doesn't stuff. doesn't jive at all. I mean, but it's very popular from a provincial point of view to say, you know, we're not going to fund adults the same as teenagers, and then say, but well, wait a minute, our welfare rolls are are increasing. People don't have education. Somebody should do something. Well, it's a lot cheaper for a board of education to do it than some of uh, some other uh, institutions. Mm. I had people who were in their uh, 30s and 40s who had been on the computer for the first time. Uh, I was teaching accounting to uh, people who were, were thinking about running their own businesses and this was the first exposure that they had had mm -hmm. to accounting, marketing, the whole idea of sales, advertising, getting out there and many of them have gone out there and started their own businesses and I think that was a valuable contribution to society in general and, and I feel that um, it was the money was worthwhile and it was well spent um, unfortunately the government decided that uh, that wasn't a priority that it wasn't the government's um, role to to educate or re-educate or to retrain people in the public school system that that would be done by continuing education at a much lower cost uh, by people who were genuine hard-working but paid far less than I guess we were. They wanted to uh, turn it into a business. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's nothing wrong with turning things into a business, but um, when it comes to dealing with people, you can't always do that. You can't always be looking at the bottom line. And you can't always be looking for a profit. You have to to be sure that uh, what you're doing is for the good of the person and not uh, counting the number of units output or, or um, you know, or just simply saying, well, this, class, this school has done well because it has an 80 or 90 average. Well, you got to look at where they came from and you got to look at where they ended up. Did they make progress? And uh, I see this happening in a lot of the college systems and the university systems right now where uh, government is giving performance objectives, saying we want you to have a certain of uh, level of graduation, we want to have a certain level of marks, and of course, uh, funding is connected with that. And it's not unusual to think that um, the marks at certain colleges or universities might come up to those levels. And of course, uh, those levels of funding will be sustained. Yeah. If that's what the government wants, I'm sure that's what the government will get. But uh, does it necessarily mean that uh, education has been served as a result of it? I'm not sure. How did that go? 
We are from Midland, proudly we hail thee, onward with the green and gold, boom, boom, boom. Onward to victory, honor and glory, we are striving for these goals, boom, boom. Always we'll try to cherish our motto, semper ad optimum, boom, boom, boom. Proudly we hail her, honor will gain her, honor for the green and gold. Yeah, that was it. Hey, my name is Judy Hannanen. I am a mother of a child that was attending Midland Collegiate. He'd only started grade nine. Um, I met Irma through our cause of trying to save Midland from closing. Okay. Uh, Irma Kemp. Um, I'm a parent from Midland Collegiate. My daughter finished grade OAC last year, and Jason is there in grade 11 now. It was November, though, when the um, provincial government, uh, 98, um, <coughs> when the provincial government decided in its infinite wisdom that the budget for the uh, all of uh, the Board of Educations across Ontario would no longer be able to be funded through their own municipal governments and that they were going to therefore be footing the whole bill and they were going to reconstruct the whole of the education system. So it started back then and the Board of Education, Toronto Board of Education, initially wanted to close 138 yeah. schools and a big alarm went off and there was so much confusion as to what criteria would be to keep a school open, keep a school closed. Everybody was upset and I think the ball got rolling then. Um, and then it went into the spring of 99 and they then issued another list of 30 schools, 37. Thirty. They were going to close 30 over three years, so 10 each year. And that was mentioned in April and we found out at the end of April like that our school was on the first list of 10. So, results, schools closed and parents get angry and mm -hmm. I suppose parents try and do something about it, no? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think that's been the hardest, saddest thing has been watching parents whose schools are closing. We really, really tried to get parents not to to do two things at the same time, to fight for their own school, but to also to try to stay away from saying close their school instead, you know, that which is a which is your kind of natural inclination. But also to keep their eye on the whole problem instead of just their school, to go, this is a provincial problem and it's because of the funding formula. And but it's it's terribly hard. The process has been uh really awful I think in Toronto and in most places I think it hasn't been very fair it hasn't been it's been very hard for boards to be brave enough to just say we're closing your school no matter what you do we've decided this there's no way we can keep it open we don't have enough money instead they go through and they do this all over the province this long process of consultation and we'll talk about it and we'll see if we can figure out different things to do except the end result always is your school closes there's been very, very few where they've actually taken it back. One school here, I think, in Toronto. Uh, and, you know, other places, even when that gets taken back for a year, it just gets closed the following year. Um, and it's a really emotional thing. I mean, I know that when my kid's school was on the list, and that's when there was a huge list of schools that were going to close, um, I, I cried, I, and for, because it was my, I'd moved really a lot when I was a kid, and, and this was the longest I'd ever lived anywhere in my life, and it was my community. These were, this was my, you know, I finally had a community, and suddenly it was going to be taken away from me, and it was really big, and I had no idea. I mean, I'd been blithely going around talking about it as a kind of political issue, but until then it happened to me, and then I, you know, phoned all the press in tears and which you're not supposed to do. Um, it's not a very political activist thing to do but it's it's really I mean that's been the hardest thing you know in terms of trying to explain to a government who doesn't see who wants to who, who's trying to just sort of get away with how cheaply they can do something that to explain in a kind of uh, an amorphous or weird sort of uh, notion like the emotional connection or the necessity of a, a, a community school or a school in your community, they just go, 
you know, show me the dollars and then I'll understand it. But the formula whereby you can figure out that, it, as, you know, and it's actually, I mean, it, it's horrible enough in the city when your school closes, but in little tiny towns when the school closes, it's appalling. Some, it can be the end of the community. And it's, I think that, you know, the things that you can't measure or fund are that parents meet other parents in schools, that your, your, the neighborhood is enhanced, it makes a difference to business, it makes a difference to real estate prices, it makes a difference to, but it makes a difference to the, you know, the kind of quality of life. And that can't be measured and it can't be, you know, there's no formula for that and there's no way of putting dollars on it. And so they, it becomes this kind of hard clinical sort of exercise of we need to save and the, you know, both Toronto boards talk about it that way, this many square feet. You know, we've got two million square feet of unfunded spaces, space and we've got to cut it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they're doing. You had a new principal at this time, right? Uh, Nadine Siegel came on board in 98. And her reaction was that uh, of the um, staff? Yes, she wanted to fight to keep the school open. At that time, we were under the misconception that the board would really listen. We really believed that in a democratic society that our elected officials would listen to us. And so we began a lobbying process. We started with the school trustees, the elected officials. We started with our MPPs, the uh, member of provincial parliament. We thought they would listen to us. Um, <laughs> we went to the media. We thought they would listen to us. And uh, as I say, it was a misconception. Were you part of a staff group? Yes, or I was the SOS committee, Save Our School committee. The beginning of May, we had a meeting at the school saying, okay, we're on the list. Um, we have to um, get a area review committee together, which involved principals of the six schools in our area, six high schools, and um, a parent from each school, a student from each school, and the superintendents and the trustee was invited. Um, it was actually a quiet arc. They didn't have a lot to say. I went to every meeting. We never, I never missed a, a meeting, um, but as an observer, we weren't allowed to talk. You had to sit and listen. Um, you, you weren't allowed to speak up? No. And that was... Now, what was the mandate of these things? What, what were they supposed to be doing? Well, I think the mandate was to find uh, solutions to the closure, bearing in mind that there were criteria that you couldn't infringe upon, such as that you couldn't label another school to be closed, you couldn't... Um, they were supposed to come up with an alternative. They were supposed to come up with an alternative to school closure, which was a foregone conclusion. However, they, we were not allowed to look at uh, uh, special programming. We were not allowed to look at bringing, trying to bring children in from other areas. Um, they really strong-armed the art. Uh, I thought it was a shambles. I didn't, I didn't like the process the board adopted from the beginning. Who was the chair of that uh, commission? Do you remember? Uh, they were local things. They were, they were really local community committees that the board set up, and there was no chair. This was part of the problem. There was, there was nobody in charge of the process to, to define what the mandate was and to define what the issues were they were looking at. And they brought in a mediator who was a retired principal from Etobicoke to help the group consider the issues and supposedly come to consensus. Uh, and from what I understand, he managed to uh, aggravate and, and uh, really frustrate a lot of people's attempt to, to look at what the issues were. And then part of it is he didn't have the authority to impose, uh, to impose an agenda on people. People weren't willing to adopt an agenda. There was too much disagreement around the table. I mean, essentially what we had done is taken a school that was, that was slated or, or, or proposed to close uh, and put it at a table with nine or ten or eleven other schools that were not slated to close who knew that if Midland didn't close, one of them would have to. How much cooperation can you get around the table like that? You know, it's, it's a, it, you, you turn it into a situation of us or them, and that's what the school board managed to do in their in their local committee process. This area review committee. This was in fact the this was in fact the public hearing, right? This was the well, it wasn't very public, and they certainly didn't hear. But uh, yes, that was that was this ostensible function. Its function is to give a public hearing to the decision. Yes, yes, but you weren't allowed to speak. <laughs> It was a public hearing, but they didn't listen. 
and the uh, the. Ch- That's right. Irma, Irma told me that. I, I found that rather surprising. That in fact it was it was something that they were supposed to review the decision, but there was. No- but it didn't. They. I think they came into the area review committee meetings with the decision already having been made, and I couldn't believe it. The so-called facilitator kept saying again and again, um, "Well, when Midland closes, well, Midland is closing." And what are we going to do? And which school is going to get this? And wh- which which schools will the students go to? And we kept saying, aren't we supposed to provide you with proposals on how to keep Midland open? And then if the proposals don't fly, then we will consider Midland closing? Okay, uh, perhaps you can confirm something or not. Irma, I was talking with Irma, this is now last year, but she said that in the parents, amongst the parents, they felt that... Uh, when SOS committee reconvened in, in September, uh, they felt that somehow the, the teachers had been told to sort of put a lid on their on their protest. Was was this true or not? I was never told personally, but I heard from some of my colleagues that yes, they had been called into the principal's office and in very plain terms told to cease and desist. The principal over the summer when we had all our meetings, she was invited, she didn't get involved. We had a secretary that kept minutes and did give her copies of all the minutes so she did know what was happening. It wasn't until the first week of school when the teachers were back getting, or the, the week before school opened, that the teachers that were involved, I guess there was a meeting at the school and they were more or less told enough is enough and that was the end of any teacher involvement. The attitude of the school trustees was what? I mean, did your local trustee support you? Oh, he was horrible. <laughs> to put it quite bluntly, he was he he had it out. He felt the school should have been closed years ago. He's a young guy. He hasn't been. He's not married. He still lives at home. He has no children. He doesn't understand. And we couldn't get across to him. The reason this is a community issue. This is not a, a children's issue. This is not, you know. It's a community issue. You're ripping the heart of the community out when you rip out a school. It's what keeps people in the community bound together. Um, and we tried to get that across to him. We tried to get him to see that busing, the, uh, we're in a community where the kids would have to take a bu- two to three buses to get out of the area to get to a new school. I mean, he just he just didn't get it. He was playing a political game where he was going along following procedure. We just see him as being a trustee for his own personal gains. He wants to get into politics and this is his stepping stone. So he never helped the community and the community will remember. How did you feel about this whole process? Well of course I was extremely depressed by the outcome, that the closure. I felt, as uh, Bruce Elliott has mentioned, that the political will to keep the facility open was not there. We did have a dozen parents, however, who were active on our their Save Our School Committee, and they did mount a very vocal and ongoing campaign to save the school, such as letter writing to the trustees, which was almost a weekly thing for, uh, for many months. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly a large number of parents did turn out uh, to our evening at the board office at the Scarborough Town at Center. Yeah. Uh, we, we filled the place. We had many students mm-hmm. there. We had many parents there. We had parents speak at the evening. I think there were about 20 to 25 presenters that evening. That's right. And the hall was quite there. So they were there in numbers. Uh, however, b- being new Canadians, the the detriment of, of it being a new language, a second language for you, as English is for many of our parents, uh, may be an inhibiting factor pol- to political involvement. Yeah. However, they made their presence certainly felt that night at the Scarborough Town Centre uh, that we made our presentation mm-hmm. to the board to keep the school open. Yeah. I don't think that the letters that we sent on to the trustees really mattered. I, I think their mindset was uh, to close uh, Midland. And it was very difficult to fight against that. You always felt as if you were knocking your head against a brick wall uh, because of that that closed mind situation. For the big question mark, but they didn't want to deal with this. No, we're not dealing with that. We're going to get X amount of dollars by doing this. We're close the school. We want to close the whole school. We wanted partial leasing. They wouldn't give us partial leasing because they felt that they couldn't make up enough money from partial leasing. They want to lease the whole school. 
And then we said, well, what about R.H. King? You're going to move some of these kings, kids to R.H. King? You've got to upgrade the school. Well, the money will come from the closure. We'll take some of the proceeds from the closure and upgrade a school that is mm -hmm. so terribly in need of... It, it is so bad. Yeah. It would have made more sense to just move R.H. King, move the whole thing over to Midland because the the kids coming into the area would be so much easier transportation-wise. and. It, it was just so, so poorly looked at. So this commission has its final sort of public hearing on the 9th of June, 99? Around then, yeah. Yeah, were you there at that time? No, I didn't participate in the local committees. Uh, I didn't see it as my role to. Um, ultimately, as a trustee, I'm going to have to make a decision. And I'm going to have to make a decision on a committee report. And I didn't think it was appropriate uh, for trustees to be influencing what that report would say and then voting on it at the board table. Uh -huh. But you got you'd been, you'd been contacted by the parents that they put their brief to you. Relative yeah, I'd, I'd seen the, I'd seen the information. Yeah, and I met with them over the summer too. Yeah, yeah. So, what did you think of uh, their point of view? Did you think it was uh, emotional, or did you think there was some sort of rationale at the time behind their argument? I think there. I think there's a bit of both. Um, there's good reasons to keep any school open, and there's a lot of bad reasons to close any school. Uh, we talked to school trustees. None of us took those jobs to close schools. It's not something we want to do. Uh, and I also actually believe in the value of having a small student population. I went to a school that had 120 students in it. So small schools, something I philosophically agree with, uh, but not s small student populations inside of huge plants, huge physical buildings. Um, so there were rational reasons for keeping a school open. There weren't really rational reasons for keeping Midland open. Uh, and there were a lot of emotional reasons, as it would be for any school. And I certainly empathize with that. Uh, you can't, you can't not. Anybody who's been part of the school would empathize with that because we, you know, we know how attached we come, we come to it. Uh, but from a rational perspective, it would be Midland, with which was at about 50 percent of capacity, uh, or eight small elementary schools that were at 70 to 80 percent capacity. Balance that out, and those were those were the terms. And from your point of view, that was the my, was the choice. That was the issue for me. Yeah. The local trustee was a guy named Jeff Kendall. Oh that? yes, Jeff Kendall. Yes, he came to a couple of our meetings. He seemed to indicate that if we could come up with viable business solutions to what was essentially a business problem, the schools were losing money because of lack of enrollment. Jeff reiterated that the problem for a TDSB, Toronto District School Board, is money, and I've put money in capital letters. Funds are extremely limited and the envelopes are clearly separated into instructional funds and non-instructional funds. According to Jeff, there are only three ways to keep Midland open. A. Find money in the budget. B. Put money in the budget. C. Come up with new money. So at that point, July 26th, he seemed to indicate that it would be possible for us to save our school if we came up with ways to generate money for the TDSB. The ways that would allow Midland to stay open but generate money. So we got all excited and we went out and we solicited lessees. And we had three of them who wrote letters of intent to the Toronto District School Board saying that they would be agreeable to leasing a part of Midland Avenue Collegiate. Some of the teachers say that um, <laughs> you had said at one point that uh, the choice was either to come up with new sources of money or else to uh, move money around within the budgets and so on and so on. And, and uh, their feeling was that some proposals which they had got onto paper about leasing part of the school hadn't been carefully looked at either. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was... Carefully looked at to some people means not agreed with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you don't agree with their decision it would, or their suggestion, it wasn't carefully looked at. I don't have to look very carefully at suggestions, which I've already looked at carefully. Uh, and in fact, none of the suggestions that were presented to either myself or, or to the planning staff were things that we hadn't considered before we looked at closing schools. Uh, and partial leasing of the school was really the crux of the, of the recommendation of Midland. And it's just not tenable. You, you can't have a building that's a school uh, that's built for access within it. It's not a building that's segregated off into parts. Uh, you can't start leasing that out to companies and, and other groups who want to bring their own people into the school. 
because you can't control when they're coming in, who they're going by, and what they're doing when they're in your building. Uh, it's one thing to lease out a whole school, and then if they have trespassers, it's their problem. But you can't lease out half of a school to different groups and expect to be able to maintain the security of the premises that we need to as a school board. And so what did the community lose? I mean, it's an incident, aside from the fact that, okay, great auditorium, great swimming pool, and so on and so on. I think they lost a very vibrant learning hub within their community, uh, a hub that uh, provided them with, uh, with excellent facilities. And, and the facilities, I think, lift students. They inspire you. The fact that you go through halls and they're lighted and that you have access to a, a, a wonderful cafeteria that's a, a walled structure of glass that you can constantly look out and into your community and, and, and have light come in. There was almost a kind of a, a reciprocal uh, relationship between the school and its surroundings because you were always looking out into the community. Uh, it was a welcoming place because of the, of the design, uh, its structure, the wide hallways, the ample foyer, uh, the two-story library for example. Uh, the very structure of the building was student and staff friendly and I think that that does something uh, when you're entering such a building. Uh, it simply lifts you, it lifts your spirits uh, to be in such a facility and the community benefits uh, from having ready access for their students students to go into such a building and uh, it, it, again it's a facility for the community to use in terms of its auditorium and pool as well and a meeting place too and I think that's lost and simply having to have your, your students now uh, commute take buses, go out of the area uh, to get to another school, that can be a detriment to student learning too because it's more difficult for those students to get to the, the building on time, for example, having to, uh, to take buses, having to walk in inclement weather a long distance if they're coming to a, another school instead of a neighborhood school. All of that has an impact, I think, on success rates, on dropout rates. Uh, and so I think the community will feel for many years the impact of, of the school closing. Conclusion? <clears throat> Moral of the story? Well, I don't know. We fought the fight. <laughs> we didn't, we feel like we didn't accomplish anything. Um, I don't know that I would do it again. It just Your feels too heavy or just not democratic? Enough? It just not democratic. Uh, the decision had been made. Yeah, the decision was made and they just, it's, they're letting you, they're making you feel that, oh, we have a say, but it doesn't matter because they're, they've decided and you sit and you talk and even while you're talking a couple of them just go through papers and talk to each other and, and they're not listening to a thing anybody said, not just me, anybody. It doesn't matter who's talking. When they talk at regular meetings amongst themselves, they get up and they walk out of the room and they do this, they do that. The decision is made and it's just like a final vote. Okay, we've listened to you. You can't say we didn't listen. <laughs> I, I don't think it was an exercise in futility in that um, we had to fight the good fight, which was to do all that we could to save the school, to save it for the community, for the kids, for the staff, for everyone involved, because we felt a strong loyalty, strong attachment. For me, the attachment runs back decades because as a student in Midland I was on the SAC, um, I ran the yearbook as the editor and I was also the student editor of the newspaper as well so for me the, the allegiance to Midland goes back uh, back decades and I to not have struggled to keep it open I would have felt quite empty inside, I would have let my own value system down if I had not attempted to with all that I could muster to save the school. Um, I feel that we did the best we could under the circumstances. I think that groups that have come after us in other communities and other schools have learned from our activism and perhaps have been more successful. And I think the board has also changed as well in, the, in its makeup, in that it listens more to the community when the community comes forward with alternatives and with other leasing suggestions. And I think that if you look at the record now, there have been some schools saved because of that. So I don't think our efforts were futile. I think we, uh, we paved the way for other parent, uh, teacher, student, activist groups to go on and save community schools. I've had, but it's, I can't get over the people that have asked, are you going to run for trustee? 
That sounds like a good idea, Irma. No, not at all. <laughs> I'm not a politician, and it's no. just, but it's amazing the people that have said, oh, you should run for a trustee. Problem it's is, we get too emotional about it. It's hard to keep the, um, the issue at hand, you, because you do get wrapped up emotionally. I did. I got very wrapped up in this issue. Um, I felt there was a lot at stake. I still do. Think, I'm still waiting to see the fallout. But um, I, I couldn't sleep at night if, if all this was going through my head. So yeah, it's I'd be up walking the floor and writing some letters and pacing and no, I, I, I can't do that. I shall talk to you soon. Okay. Yep. When I think about what is left for physical paraphernalia, we have to go down to the beaches. This is where Duncan Green lives, who showed me what he had salvaged from the final debacle. More on that later. As for what's left in people's minds, I thought the best thing would be to talk to the most recent batch of students, the people whose faces Sharon Hershenhord showed me shining from the glossy pages of the final yearbook. So the school was considered an inner city school. Why was that? And what does that mean? Inner city? Um, Scarborough's the ghetto. <laughs> That's my daughter's opinion. <laughs> Uh, an inner city school. Um, the students there are not from economically advantaged families. They don't have many options open to them. A lot of them are new arrivals in Canada, so there's the added problem of them learning to speak English well. Mm -hmm. um, Post-secondary education is not, in some cases, even a possibility for them. They are directed into the work world because their salaries are required for the family to keep afloat. Mm -hmm. You can see by the faces, we, very, we are very multicultural, both staff and students. I met them in a place I'd never been before, the corner of Birchmount and Lawrence, Winston Churchill Collegiate. Hi, my name is Vanit, Vanit Manta, and I started going to Midland, actually when I came to this country, that was two years ago. And that was my first school I started going to, and it Where was. Where did you come from? Where you were from? I, I've come from India, Bombay, and. So what do you remember about the Midland uh, experiences? They say. Mm, I don't know. I, I remember a lot of things. Like, the, the thing I miss most, or I remember most, is when I ran for elections for for presidentship for SEC. You all remember that? Yeah. Yeah, and I lost. <laughs> But still, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and that was my slogan, Vinita is what you need. So, and it flopped as usual, but it was a lot of fun having everyone with me, you know, okay. supporting me and then not voting for me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, okay. All right. No, 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 no. Good. <laughs> All right, I skip, we'll come back. Can you give me your name, please? Hi, um, my name is Bristy. Yeah. And I was in Midland for four years, from my grade 9 to grade 12. Oh, long time. Yes, a long time. And um, what do you now, about the school? now that I think about Midland, everything I remember is positive. Like I can't remember actually nothing happened bad to me in that school, and everything was awesome. What I liked the best about Midland was that it was small, and ev like everybody was a family. And all these people sitting here, I don't know all of them, but I know their faces. And so in Midland, you knew everybody pretty much, even though if you don't talk to them. And you know, you go down the hall, you say hi to 10 people before you could get to class. And the teachers, you knew all the teachers, and you're like so friendly with the teachers, not like a big school where you can't even get in touch with everybody. Yeah. And Actually, now one thing I regret is not going to the, all the meetings and everything when Midland was closing down. And um, I thought, you know, I was just thinking, oh, I, didn't, I don't need to go. It will never close down because, you know, with all these people in here, the government would never close it down. But to my surprise, they did. But I really regret, you know, not showing up myself and okay. saying what I had to say for it. Can we make a connection between this and the way that democracy functions in Canada? I mean, yeah. I mean... I think what's been interesting for me is going back and reading about Ryerson and reading about the sort of the beginnings of how we how and why we got a public education system that was you know free and universal and he talked a lot and we we used to know but except now we kind of toss off you know it's the cornerstone of democracy we say those kind of things but we forget you know what it means and and I think that we have to remember that, that the reason that you have to have a public education system in order to have a democracy um, 
is that you you have to educate voters for one thing. You have to educate people who can participate in the democracy, and it's vital uh, that you 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 give that education on a fair basis. You have to give everybody an equal chance to be educated enough to participate in the democracy. The motivation for uh, collecting these signatures and, and possibly uh, forming an association? Well, um, we uh, thought that perhaps, you know, if there was going to be nothing left, this, was, this whole institution was going to vanish, that perhaps we could be the nucleus of, of something that would live past the uh, the dying of the institution, and that of course is the the past student bodies, all all years, all decades, not just the 60s. So it's in its uh, infancy right now. It hasn't really developed yet, and it's always the time and energy issue, of course, of of uh, being able to do this. My name is Manoja Wijewardena. And I was in Midland for two years, and that's when I came to uh, Canada. I went to Midland, that was my first school. I came from uh, United Arab Emirates, I'm originally from Sri Lanka. And um, I, my, uh, the only thing I don't like is the reason why they closed the school, it wasn't good enough. Just because that each student is given a specific square feet, um, none of them. Um, Nobody considered like uh, what we would feel about the closing. None of us thought it'll close because um, I don't know. Midland uh, had a lot of history. That's to us. I'm not sure. You know, it's funny because I used to work in theater, and you know, there was many years of fighting for Canadian culture. And I, I sort of, I, I went to this function of a theater that I worked in, who that only did new Canadian plays. And I thought, oh, you know, I wonder why I. Why do I do what I do now when I did then, did that then? And I realized they were part of the same thing and that part of the fight for Canadian culture was in a way, uh, and in a way a fight that maybe we didn't win very well. And the kind of things you lose are other parts of your culture, public education being one of them. And, and I think that the, the fit between public education and democracy works both ways. For one thing, you have to have a public education system in order to have a democracy. And for another thing, in a democracy, um, there are different levels of democracy, and one of the levels we're losing now is the sort of local democracy level that school boards um, represented, that were part of the, th you know, we've had school boards before we had, before we were a country, before Confederation there were school boards. Um, because, and they were set up to meet local needs. It was really important that you actually did that. I've heard it said that the academic standards weren't very high, there were a lot of basic level students, that sort of thing, and so on and so on. Was that fair, do you think? No, no, no. no. They, tried to help everybody. Yes. they tried to help everybody at every level. So that people say a lot of things, but it's not true. Yeah. They're just yeah. jealous, you know? Because <laughs> Midland is so better, it's cool, it's wide open, it has a nice swimming pool, gym, the football field, the cafeteria, the fries, the mayonnaise, I mean, whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Honestly, anyway, it's yeah. exactly. It's the foyer was the best part. It's so yeah. big. It's like compared to this way, it's like ten times bigger. Like when you walk in, like it's like a football field, like right there. You can just like yeah. play like play hockey or cricket or whatever. Yeah. When I yeah, when I came to the school, I heard a lot of. Uh, like I heard that Midland had a bad reputation, but you don't know how good it is till you're there. So, yeah, I don't think they should uh, make comments if, you do, if they don't know anything. So, and the academic standard really like depends on yourself. I think people think Midland is you know not as high as a level as uh, other schools, but what I found was I'm I was I'm doing OAC right now, so I had a big change from grade 12 and I had to come here and finish up my OACs. What I think is that in Midland you got a lot of help because you had a small school and all the teachers knew you and they're willing to help you. I mean, like other schools, I've talked to my friends who go to other schools, it's like, they give you something and you're totally on your own. But in Midland, you got help from other teachers. You had questions and you, had to, you could go to other, you know, help, get help from people. Is the dog around down here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's actually, coming. he's pretty good about things now. So tell me about this stuff. Well, this of course is a basement storage room and uh, the uh, uh, in this uh, storage room we have accumulated uh, all of the uh, plaques that were up on the walls for Midland. Uh, if we hadn't taken them, they would have ended up in the garbage. And mm -hmm. uh, there are graduating year 
photos that again were screwed onto the wall and we took them down because they would not have survived the, the experience. You also have some trophies and stuff here, right? Oh yes, there's trophies, there's old football helmets, there's videotapes that you were looking at earlier. <laughs> These uh, probably aren't regulation anymore. <laughs> yeah. Because all of this stuff was going uh, into the garbage. Oh yes, said. yeah, archery championship girls 1981 so on and on and you know all of this ended up being dumped in one room uh, all the pictures that had been up on the wall for the uh, closing ceremonies uh, the current students last year had uh, put them up on Bristol board and so it in the auditorium and gave people an opportunity to go around and, and find themselves uh, on the wall and uh, all of that would have been disposed of, and so it's now here. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's it's what's left of Midland is in the basement here. <laughs> and yet, I've been told that when people were forming the committees against the school closing, there, there weren't too many students involved. Uh, how come? Mm -hmm. okay, um, how come the students didn't mobilize more? No or one actually, actually believed that Midland would actually close. No one actually, like... Thought that like I guess all of us were like yeah no it won't close like you know we went there for two years or it was a yeah. me and such like yeah. Yeah. can you start that again <laughs> till t till the last minute you didn't know if the school was closing down or not and I think just a month before Midland was actually closing down like Midland was closing down in June and in May or in April we came to know that the school is closing down in May. In May, they actually, like, it was a formal thing that the school is closing down and... And there was an understanding 150 years ago that you... about the importance of public education, about the, you know, Ryerson said it was, you know, it should be the first charge on the wealth of the province and that it had to be publicly funded and it couldn't, none of the expense should fall on, to, on parents and... Um, and he understood that and he understood it because it was important um, that you educate a, a civil community, I think he called it, that, you know, that we were educating citizens here. And that that's why it's not just an issue for me because I'm a parent. I mean, he even talked about the difference between training and education and that it was not training that, that, that people needed. It was a, he talked about the importance of all the different, the, all the different faculties that had to be brought into exercise and by, by what the arts and music and drawing and um, physical education. And I think that I don't know. It's like a lot of things <laughs> these days. Having a de democratic, you know, participating in a democratic society, having public institutions. I think we've for we've forgotten the original reason why we had those things. And in forgetting that, we kind of just assume they'll always be there. And in making that assumption, we put them in danger. And they're in danger by all different kinds of governments. There's tons of cuts happening by NDP government governments too, provincially. And so it's not, and it's in that way that it's not necessarily a left-right thing. It may be more in that way that we've forgotten our, you know, Canadians were always, you know, we did have a culture, I believed, maybe I'm wrong, but, um, and part of it was an understanding of our social responsibility, and we were nice, you know, we cared about other people. And I think that, that those, all, those things all go together, and that, that's, that becomes the real concern when you start to have a funding formula based on square feet. You go, that's never been what a, an education system was supposed to be about or for, and, 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 and shows us that this, you're not, you don't get it. You know, this is not the, um, you know, where, we're, where we should be heading at all. One of the it reasons that they closed the school, so people say, is that there weren't, there weren't too many options because cause there were so few students, they weren't able to open up the options. Was, was this a problem? <coughs> No, 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 no. I think it's the opposite. Because they had fewer students, that's why I think fewer students had more options than yeah. compared to this school. Yeah. No, honestly, we that's why I think. All kind of sports. Like yeah. we have all, almost all kinds of sports, like carom, chess, and like uh, archery. <coughs> basketball, hockey, and cricket, football, 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 Yes? <laughs> I'm waiting for you because I knew that. The other thing about Midland that I, I don't think any of us mentioned yet, it was very multicultural. And that was such a positive thing about Midland because everything that would happen, multicultural day, everything that would happen, it would be so multicultural. So, you know, you didn't have discrimination and all that in that, in that little school as much because you couldn't live with that. Mm -hmm. If you're if you like a, 
you know, discriminating others, you couldn't really be in that school because mm. everybody around you is from a different country, speaks a different language at home. And like everything was so much fun, like multicultural day. And we had things that other schools didn't have, like we had a cricket team. Not every school had a cricket team. Uh, um, pretty rare, no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we had Karam and everything. <clears throat> and like, you know, we had multicultural teachers. Teachers from India would teach Karam and from the Caribbeans. <clears throat> They would teach Karam and stuff. There was everything. Like, I don't think there was any lack of options in Midland at all. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry. She's talked about the cricket team. Midland was the first collegiate in Scarborough to have a cricket team. Wow. The first. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, what was your connection to Midland? <laughs> Actually, I went to Midland in 1963. 1963, same right. year I was there, right? The second year that I op opened, yes. Yeah. And I was the first black student to graduate from Midland. Yeah, if you look at those photos, there aren't many. <laughs> okay, let me talk to uh, an ex-English teacher of Midland here. So, do, do, you, do, you find, do you find that what the kids are saying is pretty well true about the atmosphere in the school? I, yes, I relate to a lot of what they're saying. Uh, I noticed in my classes being able to look around the class and see the, the mix of cultures. But not only that, what really impressed me there was that the different cultures worked together. The students were each other's friends. They didn't just uh, stick with students from their own culture, but there was such a mix and it was just amazing to look out and see that kind of interaction going on. I'll always remember that about Midland. Well, I can say that this event has politicized me. Um, I've, I've always taken the opportunity to vote. I have always made my concerns known but this was the first time that I had the courage to step up to a microphone and say what I felt publicly. Mm -hmm. um, this was the first time that I spoke to my students in terms of don't sit back and be complacent because people up there are making decisions that are going to affect you for the rest of your lives. Speak up now, become politically active now in your teens. And I thought, how can I, as an educator, mobilize the students in my care without becoming a demagogue, mm -hmm. without saying, you must believe what I believe. I'm, I hope I try to teach them, believe what you choose, but act on your beliefs. Don't sit. Don't sit on your hands. When you have the opportunity to vote, do it. Don't say it's just one vote. It won't matter. It does matter. I never thought I would see the day when someone would say that an event concerning my high school had politicized them. After all, my memories of the place were completely and totally apolitical, a source of some carping and criticism later on. The building remained dark and closed throughout that winter. It didn't show any new life until I returned more than a year later to find the doors sporting a new color and crested with a new name. If the fundamental goal of the Conservatives had been to make more space available for private education, this was an idea that Jeff Kendall had expressed to me, here they succeeded brilliantly. And the new occupants didn't even seem to have the same qualms about partial leasing that the school board had had. There were all kinds of groups and activities occupying different corners of the premises. Sharon Hershenhorn might take some comfort in the fact that the new school promotes an international focus. I'm not sure it's exactly what she had in mind. So I guess Cal and Brian had been right. There just hadn't been the political will to keep it open. Anyway, in the autumn of 2003, I learned, along with the rest of the world, that that particular Conservative government had finally got booted out and a new period was opening in Ontario politics. But how much of the damage could be restored? And was there the will to restore it? Once you've destroyed things that were of value, you can't just go back to the way they were before. Even if you reinvest, destruction creates its own inertia. The community reorganizes itself 
and things go on differently. The loss and the cost are perhaps largely intangible, but they are there, nonetheless absolutely real. I just hope that the next time some political huckster says that the way forward to true happiness is downsized government and less expenditure, people will think a little harder before they buy it.